Good morning, brethren, church of the living God, the ground and the pillar of the truth. Hi. Get your authorized version of the scriptures and turn with me in your authorized version of the scriptures to Romans chapter 3. We are going to kind of dive into somewhat of an expository video, somewhat of an expository video dealing with Romans chapter 3, somewhat. Um, the best way to describe what this video is going to be about is, men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? Because there are those out there that will come to Romans chapter 3 and say that verses 24 on to verse 26 is the pure gospel, excluding Romans chapter 10 and attacking Romans chapter 10. Um, brethren, I will submit unto you that those who use, who say that Romans 3, 24 and 26 are the pure gospel, uh, that exclude and attack Romans 10, and just like Jesuit coadjutors like to twist it and do all kinds of weird things to it, these people have never been used of the Lord to guide someone onto himself. The only thing that they have been used for is by their father, the devil, Satan, to create false converts. Okay? So, did, did that get your attention? I hope so. So, what we're going to do is... We are going to read in Romans chapter 3, and we're going to have some stops along the way. We're going to begin at verse 10, and we are going to read on to verse 28. Okay? Please follow me along. You are expected to. Okay? Romans chapter 3, beginning at verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. That includes you. That includes me. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. Understanding is depart from evil. Okay? Understanding is to depart from evil. Do you understand? And in departing from evil, seeking God. But see, of our own initiative... We, as lost, fallen man, do not take it upon ourselves to one day wake up, okay, I'm going to go after God and believe and become a Christian today. No, it doesn't work like that. God draws us, okay? Verse 12, they're all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. See, that, that's you, and that's me, okay? Nobody is good. No one does good, okay? Their throat is an open sepulcher, an open grave. Their tongue, with their tongues, they have used deceit, lies. The poison of asps is under their lips. <laughs> with with the way they speak, they kill people, pretty much. A lot of these uh, Jesuit coadjutor false teachers here on YouTube and also in the pulpits, okay? Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Swift to shed blood. They go after the innocent. They go after people who do not know. And they go after people who are uh, seeking to serve the Lord and to walk with Him and to align their lives according to the Scriptures. See, those of us who are of the Church of the Living God are an offense unto the coadjutor and unto the devil and unto those who call themselves Christian. Okay? And there is a distinction that needs to be made, in my opinion. And thank you to the one brother who gave me a very polite rebuke about it. And you know who you are, and you are right. 
but also and on to the other uh, brother, I hope, <laughs> who um, kind of went along with that. Um, I ain't backing off of that, by the way. I understand what you were saying, but I ain't backing off of that. Okay? I do believe that there needs to be a distinction in these last days between those who call themselves Christians and those who are of the Church of the Living God. And I've already explained that, my stand on that. So, I won't get off on that. Verse 16, Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. And here it is in a nutshell. There is no fear of God before their eyes. There is no fear of God before their eyes. See, now here's the thing. The book of Romans, Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 2, when the Lord will use you as an empty vessel to guide someone onto himself, he will use you, okay, uh, to speak to someone through the scriptures uh, using the book of Romans, okay? Romans 1 and Romans 2 deal specifically with the lost state, the fallen nature of man, okay? Romans chapter 3 here specifically is also pointing the finger. And verses 10 on to verse 18 specifically make it personal. It's personal. Points the finger right at you, just like our Lord does. That one thing, one thing thou lackest. And he always puts his finger on that one thing. See, the thing about Romans chapter 3, verses 10 on to verse 18, which is why so many like to avoid it, it takes it and makes it personal. Personal. See, anyone could say, yeah, everybody's a sinner, but what about you? And how many times have I encountered myself personally? Hi. The, uh, when you talk with people, oh yeah, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, yeah, yeah, you keep talking, you, uh, they, uh, you know, use the scriptures, okay? And in roundabout, roundabout, it finally comes out, well, I'm not as bad in, uh, uh, as so-and-so, yeah, I'm a sinner, but I haven't done what he's done. Aha, right there, see, that's, that's the thing. That's why when you're reading Romans chapter 3, specifically verses 10 on to verse 18, are so crucial. Because it makes it personal. You can't get around it. See, Romans 1 and 2 leads you up to it. And here it is. Cuts you. This is why people like to avoid it. And instead they cast a blanket over everything to make it general instead of personal. See? That's the issue. It's, this is addressing personally, not in general. Even though it says all but see, you put yourself there. That includes me. That includes you. And they ain't getting around that. And if people try to get you around that, they seek to make you a false convert. Beware. Beware. Now, let's pick up at verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Hmm. Now like I said, Romans 1 and 2 and up to verse 18 in Romans chapter 3 is leading you up, showing you your lost condition, your need for something. What is that something? See, that's what it's about. Romans 1 and 2 and up to uh, Romans 3, up to verse 18 is 
there to show the lost person, hey, you're in trouble. There, you need something. What is it you need? Is it the law? The law, you know, the law, the law of Moses, that kind of thing. Let's read verse 19 again. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Turn with me. I'm using two sets of scriptures. To Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, we are going to be reading verses 1 on to verse 14, okay? Romans chapter 7, verses 1 on to verse 14. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. What does that mean? Let's keep reading. Wherefore, my brethren... Ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. We should bring forth fruit unto God. He's addressing saved brethren of the church of the living God. That's what it means uh, by the body of Christ. Okay, the body of Christ the church of the living God. He is addressing saved brethren, sisters of the church of the living God in this, okay? Keep that in mind, okay? Let's continue. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. The oldness of the letter is referring on to the law. Okay? It is not referring on to the scriptures. Okay? There are many out there who will take, will come to this and say that you, know, you don't need to read the scriptures. Okay? Uh, the, some of these, um, what is that, emergent church people. Okay? They're, they're the kind of type that say, put the scriptures away. You don't need that. Go with your feelings. Okay? That's not what that's talking about. The oldness of the letter is referring to the Old Testament law. Okay? That's what that's referring to. It is not telling you, it is not referring on to the scriptures that you don't need the scriptures. That's a lie. Beware of that. Okay? Let's continue. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, pay attention. I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. See, yes, yes, okay. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, animalistic lust. For without the law, sin was dead. What does verse 8 mean? 
Let me put it to you like this, okay? In the Garden of Eden, when God made everything, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was the one thing, the one thing that God said unto Adam and Eve, you can eat, okay, you can eat all this stuff. Go ahead, go ahead, but see that tree? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Don't eat it. Don't eat of it. For the day you eat of it, you're going to die. Okay? He never said, don't touch it. Okay? And what happens? Satan comes along, the serpent, tempts Eve. Eve adds to the word of God. And what does Satan do? The first thing in recorded scripture, what is the first words of Satan in recorded scripture? Yea, hath God said. Questioning God's word. Nowadays, they're called textual critics, trained by Jesuits, so you know, okay? But, first appearance of Satan, the serpent, yea, hath God said. Eve adds to the word of God, and then Satan says, ye shall not surely die, for in the day ye eat thereof, God doth know that ye shall be as gods, that your eyes will be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And then Eve took the fruit, gave it to Adam, they ate of it, and voila, here we are. They disobeyed what God had said. And because of that, brought all of this upon every single one of us. That includes you too. You can't get away from that. That's why here in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 on to verse 18 is very crucial for you. Because like I said, it makes it personal, see? Okay? But the point is, when Adam and Eve sinned and did what God said not to do, their eyes were opened and they were made aware of sin, where before sin was not there, okay? And disobeying what God hath said brought a very big consequence. Now, what happens when someone tells you don't do something, what happens? Come on, be honest with yourself. I'm not talking to the church of the living God at the moment. When someone tells you, hey, don't do that, that's bad for you, what do you do? You want to do it, don't you? You know, uh, think about the picture about the big red button, okay, that it's in the middle of something. It's like, whatever you do, don't touch that big red button. What happens? You want to go ahead and touch it because someone told you not to do it, right? Yes, you know that's true. So, but sin, taking occasion by the commandment. The law says thou shalt not covet, but sin, taking occasion by the commandment. Oh, yeah. Do not covet. Doesn't that look pretty? You can go ahead and get that. Go ahead. Yea, hath God said. You see? You see what I'm getting at? You. God, through the scriptures, has told you what you need. And it's him. And you don't like that. And because... Satan is the little g-god of this world. What God says for you not to do because it isn't good for you, you want to do it. That's what that means. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought to me all manner of concupiscence, animalistic lust. For without the law, sin was dead. You wouldn't have known. Not to covet unless it, that's what verse 7 just said. We read that, okay? That's what that means. Let's continue. For I was alive without the law once. When you didn't know certain things that uh, the scriptures say, when you didn't know this or that, you were alive. You didn't know it was bad. Right? But when the commandment came, what does that mean? For example, you lost people. 
Someone of the Church of the Living God will come across your path one day and present to you the truth, the true gospel, that you ain't good and that repentance is you being broken of your self-righteousness. I've seen it. You talk with people. They go round and round and round and round and eventually it comes back to, well, I'm not as bad as this guy. That's what it, 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 so many times, that's what it comes down to. But see, until someone of the Church of the Living God, whom our Lord will use, comes to you, or is given unto you, I should say, what, is it, what do they say? Ignorance is bliss, right? For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Because you found out that God said, don't do that. But then again, remember, and uh, I'm a short, <laughs> about eight out of ten people out there today in this world. Verse 18 in Romans chapter 3. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And see, unless the Lord calls you by grace, not Calvinism, no. God will have all men to be saved, okay? Okay? It's not this heretical elect and non-elect. No, no. But God draws you to himself. Like I said, you don't wake up one day like, <laughs> okay, today I'm going to go and look for God and be, get saved because I believe. No, 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 no. 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 It doesn't work like that. It's by grace, unmerited favor, bestowed upon the lesser from the greater. Okay? You understand? Now let's continue. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. What God tells you to abstain from is good for you. You know, all the thou shalt nots, um, that's good. But see, the whole thing about the commandments, the Ten Commandments, you got to remember, those are God's perfect Requirements. Perfect. And you at your best state can't keep them. Man at his best state is altogether vanity at your best. You can never do it. You can't do it. You can't keep the law perfectly. Because guess what, friend? You might not kill or commit adultery but have you stolen something have you lied hmm? have you set up a false idol you know the one that you look at in the mirror oh yeah yeah or what about if you're catholic you know you have your stupid little semiramis statue right see if you if you botch one you botch them all. But see, those are, or the, the law was, what does it say? And the commandment, verse 10, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Because you can't keep it. You can't. The Ten Commandments are God's perfect requirements. And guess what, cousin? You can't keep them. Even if you were to go hide yourself in a cave, you can't do it. Can't do it. Let's continue. Verse 11. For sin, taking, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Because the realization that you can't do what the law says for you to do. That's why in the Old Testament, which was under the law, they had to have animal sacrifices continually 
making animal sacrifices to cover sin. Whereas the blood of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, our Father, the, God, the blood of God shed on the cross eradicates sin. Okay? Get it. We'll touch on that a little bit more here as we continue. Okay? Let's continue though in this. Verse 12. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Yes! Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not murder. Okay? Yes, that's good for you. <laughs> okay? Yes, it's holy. But you can't keep it. Nobody can. Only one could and did. Our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. God manifest in the flesh. You know, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. <laughs> Let's continue. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin. But sin. Look at that verse. Look at that verse. Was then that which is good, the commandment, made death unto me? God forbid. But sin. that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, the commandment. That sin by the commandment, it explains itself, might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, fleshly, sold under sin, fleshly. And let's skip down here to verse 24 and on to verse 25, okay? Uh, from verse 14, uh, from verse 15 on to verse 23, Paul talks about his struggle with sin, okay? But if you're not saved, that doesn't make a hell beans of difference to you. It doesn't. Because you don't have the Holy Ghost, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, and the Lord is that Spirit dwelling within you. <laughs> okay? So you have nothing on your side to combat sin. Which is why we're talking about this today. Verse 24 and verse 25 in Romans chapter 7. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. What does that mean? Let's continue in Romans chapter 8 on to verse 3. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, those who are saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death, because you can't keep it. That doesn't mean that it's something that you shouldn't strive to abstain from all appearance of evil. No, no, no. But see, before the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, okay, and his shedding of blood on the cross, Okay, that's God's perfect requirement, the Ten Commandments. No getting around that. See, we couldn't keep it. No one can. You need Jesus Christ, dear friend. Why is that? And look at here in Romans chapter 8, verse 3. For what the law could not do. The law, there's something the law cannot do. What is that? in that it was weak through the flesh. Weak through the flesh, okay? God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Sinful flesh. 
and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. But see, God manifest in the flesh did something that you or I could never do. Kept the commandments perfectly because he's God and cannot sin. You, on the other hand, hi, me too, um, we can't do that. That's why when you hear people say things like imitate Christ, run away from them. And also be very cautious of someone who says, I don't sin every day, or I can go a day without sin. Making themselves Christ-like. Beware of people like that as well. Because remember, man at his best is vanity. Remember that, okay? But now, let's go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. I'm going to be doing some reading here. Now let's refresh our memory in Romans chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. Okay? So, like I said, Romans 1, 2, and 3, up to verse 18, shows you the lost person. You got a problem. And you are guilty. You aren't good. You can't save yourself. You need something. Is it the law? Now we know that in verse 19 and 18, we're refreshing our memory. Come on, let's do this. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Galatians Chapter 3, verses 7 on to verse 25. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing, the scripture foreseeing, interesting, that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith. But the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. And the cross was made out of wood, by the way. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant. Yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Note this. He saith not and to seeds as of many. Many as of many people. But as of one and to thy seed, which is Christ. You know, the one mediator which ain't Mary. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God and Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if 
the inheritance be of the law. It is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions. Which we already looked at in Romans chapter 7. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one. But God is one. Spirit, soul, and body. Called the Godhead. Spirit, soul, and body. Not three divine persons that make one God. That's satanic heresy otherwise known as the Trinity. Yeah, yeah, I am not a Trinitarian. Trinitary, uh, the Trinity is Catholic! And I am no Papist. See the video before this one? Kind of explain myself on that. Let's continue. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise of faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards, afterwards be revealed. Noting a dispensational difference. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. And there are those out there who will say that, okay, once you are saved, that means that there are no laws for you to abide by being in Christ. <laughs> the Pauline epistles, which is doctrine for us today in this dispensation, the time of the Gentiles, uh, there's quite a few commandments for us today. Okay? There's quite a few, quite a few. Don't let someone tell you that you are lawless now as of the church of the living God. That's what Romans chapter 6 deals with, which I have a whole video on that myself, uh, myself, which if I can remember, I'll put that in the description box, okay? So, okay, are, are you with me so far? Now go to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. The book of Hebrews is written for the Hebrews. And the book of Hebrews is specifically a book written for the Jewish people during what, the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? Wrongly referred to as the Great Tribulation. No, it's the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? See, uh, Roman Catholicism and her Jesuit coadjutors um, tell you that the Great Tribulation is for the purification of the church. It's the time of Jacob's trouble, and it is for the Jew, which Roman Catholics are not. Okay? Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 under verse 14. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the shewbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. 
and over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But on into the second went the high priest alone once every year on the, uh, in Yom Kippur, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Animal blood covered. But it was a continual offering that they had to do because the blood of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, our Father, had not yet been shed on the cross. And all the Catholics with their satanic little mass are doing a continual sacrifice. Heresy. Okay? He died once. Once. And that's it. And the Catholic teaches that you have to continually, continually, continually. If you haven't figured this out by now, dear friend, Catholics are the bad guys. Let's continue. Okay. Verse 10. Which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal fleshly ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation. Reformation. Not Luther's Reformation. But what reformation are, uh, is being talked about? Let's continue. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us once, one time, one time, Catholic, one time. Not your satanic continual mass that you do. One time, one time. You're being lied to, Catholic. You're being lied to. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? You don't keep the law today to be saved or to stay saved. We've already looked at why that is. Okay? If I can remember, I'll add some videos that go into a little bit more detail to that. Okay? But it's not the law. Go back to Romans chapter 3 now. Okay? It's not the law that's needed. Because you can't keep it. So... If it's not the law, then what is it? Romans chapter 3, verse 21. But now, in this dispensation, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Psalm. Psalm 32. Psalm 32. 
Psalm 32. Verse 1 and 2. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Uh, uh, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. David was a prophet, by the way, considered a prophet. You see, you read about that in uh, Acts, I believe. Okay. Psalm 34. Verses 18 on to verse 20. Let's read verse 17. On to verse 20. The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. And save as such as be as a contrite spirit, sorrowful. Contrition is sorrowful. And see Romans chapter 3 specifically, verses 10 and verse 18, make it all personal. See, because some of you lost people can duck, dodge, and weave all you want. Uh, in Romans chapter 1 and chapter 2, I don't know how you, you know, because especially Romans chapter 2, verse 1, um, you know, addresses, well, I'm, yeah, I'm a sinner, but I'm not as bad as this guy. Okay? That's what Romans chapter 2, verse 1 specifically gets at. But see, by Romans chapter 3, verses 10 on to verse 18, you ain't dodging it unless you don't want anything to do with the Lord. Unless you are still going to remain in your pride. You need to be broken before you can be fixed. And remember, God doesn't force you to be saved. Neither does the devil force you not to come to the Lord. You do have a choice. You do have a choice. But let's continue. Verse 19 in Psalm 34. Many are the afflictions of the righteous... But the Lord delivereth him out of them all. He keepeth all his bones. Not one of them is broken. And right there could be a reference on to our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father on the cross. Okay? And now go to Psalm 51. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Psalm 51. Verses 16 and verse 17. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Brokenness and contrition, dear friend, which so many out there like to avoid and go right to just believe. Your belief is in vain if you do not come to the Lord on his terms, broken and contrite. Now, verse 22 in Romans chapter 3. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ on to all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. Go to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Come on, fingers, work with me. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 3. Verses 1 on to verse 7. Now, let's refresh our memory in verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. 
In the Old Testament, under the law, there was. Because it was the Jews. Okay? Salvation is of the Jews. Okay? The law, the commandments, were given unto the Jews. The apple of God's eye. And still the apple of God's eye. Okay? Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 on to verse 7. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. A Gentile is someone who is not a Jew. If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, to you word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. What is this mystery? Verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. What does that mean? It wasn't revealed in the Old Testament. People in the Old Testament were not looking forward to the cross because it wasn't revealed. Okay? Look at that verse. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men in different dispensations. As it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. What is this mystery? That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Which wherefore I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Which was not, look at verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. They weren't looking forward to the cross all the way back in Genesis. Okay? It's called dispensationalism. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay? I believe and teach there are seven dispensations. I'm not going to get into that. But things change. Salvation changes within the dispensation. It's not faith alone from Genesis on to Revelation. Okay? No, no, no. Within dispensations, salvation, being made right with God, changes. Okay? And if anyone tells you otherwise, they are lying to you. And they come to this, in Romans chapter 3, to deceive you. Okay? Now go back to Galatians chapter 3, because it says here in verse 22, For there is no difference. And what in lo uh, looking at this, verse 6 in Ephesians chapter 3, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. If I can remember, I'll put Romans chapter 11 um, expository video, replacement theology thing in the description of this as well. Okay? It's to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The Greek is a Gentile. Okay? We Gentiles have been grafted into their tree. And you know what? The Catholics hate that. Because they are a replacement theology. But that's the mystery. That us Gentiles are grafted into the tree of the Jew. By grace. Through faith. Okay? Now go to Galatians chapter 3. Again. See how we did that? Galatians chapter 3. Some of you were like, Brad, why didn't you finish Galatians chapter 3? Because we had to go through this. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26. On to verse 29. For ye are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. 
There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now this is talking as pertaining to salvation. There is no distinction in salvation. None. Okay? A Jew or a Gentile. Doesn't matter. Male or female. Bond or free. As pertaining to your salvation. Excuse me. As pertaining unto our Lord's salvation. Anyone. Jew or Gentile. Can be saved. Okay? That is talking about salvation. Not the distinction of culture and kindred, people. Okay? That's different. God is a God of distinction. God likes variety. But when it comes to our salvation, it doesn't matter. Anyone, yeah, even you, can be saved. The hard part is you just got to get over that one nagging thing. Yourself. And that's what Romans 1, 2, and Romans chapter 3 up to verse 18 deals with. Which is why these devils avoid it. You understand. Okay, now verse 23. For all have, in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's true. Amen. Amen. But see what these devils do. They won't deal with, they won't deal with what is being said in Romans 1, 2. And here especially verses 10 under verse 18, which make it personal to you. It ought to, unless you're so hard in your heart anyway. But see, they don't deal with that. They are the ones who don't deal with the personal. They cast a big blanket over and make it general, which, like I've, like I've said, I've, I've run it. <laughs> like I said at the beginning of this video, these people who come to Romans 3, verses 24 and 26, and leave it just at that. They have not been used of our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, to guide someone unto himself. They have not. Because someone of the church of the living God being sent, okay, Someone who was saved of the church of the living God came broken and contrite. And someone avoiding that, jumping over it, they have not been broken. They are not contrite. There is no fear of God before their eyes. You're liars. What, what say the scripture? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yes. Amen. All have sinned. There is none that doeth good. But, but see, 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 friend, here's the, here, okay, look at me. Here's the thing. It's talking about you personally. Because I, 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 I can't tell you how many times I've run into this. Round and round and round they go. Yeah, I'm a sinner. I'm not good. Yeah. Oh, I'm not as bad as so and so. I can't tell you how often I encounter that. Quite. Round. And you know what else? And this is why I am big on this distinction, especially in these last days, brethren. Okay. You're not in sin if you're calling yourself a Christian. I've made that abundantly clear. And if it and if some of you were thinking that whatever, no. But 
the roundabout thing and saying I'm not as bad as so-and-so, you know where I encounter that a lot? And those that call themselves Christians. Okay? I know what the scriptures say about it, dear brother. I do. This is what I stand for. This is what I stand on. Okay? Love you. But what say the scriptures? Go to Genesis all the way in the beginning. Genesis, that's what Genesis means, by the way. Genesis means beginning. Okay? Go to Genesis chapter 6. Now, we have... <laughs> man... <laughs> man has not evolved. Okay? Evolution is stupid. Stupid. If you believe that we evolved over millions and billions of years, you're stupid. Ah! You're stupid! Okay? And you call us, those of the church of the living God, that believe the truth that God made everything? And you call us crazy? No. Uh, no. No. <laughs> no. No. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. All the way in the beginning. Uh, Romans 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's a pretty heavy indictment there, dear friend. And uh, in Genesis chapter 6, verses 11 on to verse 12. The earth was also, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and beheld, and behold, it was corrupted, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Do you think that's changed today? Huh? <laughs> today, what is called evil is called good, and what is called good is called evil. Yeah, yeah, okay. Go to Psalm 14. Go to Psalm 14. We've already looked at this within Romans chapter 3, but this is where this is being quoted from, one of them. Psalm 14, okay? Before the law, okay, in Genesis, under the law. Psalm 14, uh, verses 1 on to verse 3. The fool has said in his heart there is no God. That's what a fool is. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. Uh, do any seek God? He seeks us. What do you do with it there, dear friend? They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. And that includes you. Yeah, you can go ahead and try to hide yourself under that blanket of, yeah, we're all sinners, and amen! Amen! All are sinners. Well, what about you? Is it personal to you? What meaneth it unto you? Because I'm, I'm telling you. You, you speak with some uh, of these people who call themselves Christians. <laughs> wow. 
round and round and round they go until it comes to the point, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. Uh, go to Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah 17. And here is another um, defensive mechanism that people who um, will, will cling to. You know, the I'm spiritual, not religious <laughs> kind of thing. Okay? It's like, well, God knows my heart. God knows my heart. Uh, we've been looking at what God thinks of your heart already. But let's clarify this. Okay? Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17. Verses 9 and 10. Dear friend, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. It's not looking too good for you, dear friend. It's not looking too good for you. Not at all. Not at all. You're not good. And when the Lord breaks you of your self-righteousness, it's not that I'm not as bad as so-and-so. No. I'm worse. I'm worse. Christ came to save sinners whom I am chief. Are you the chief of sinners? Or are you not as bad as so-and-so? That self-righteousness, dear friend. That's what needs to be repented of. Now let's read verses 24 on to verse 26. Back in Romans chapter 3. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation to faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God, to declare... That's what you're doing with this. Declaring the solution to your problem, not the how-to. It's a declaration of the answer to your problem. Do you understand? This is not like a how-to. No, this is, okay, verses 19 and 20. It's not the law that you need. Because you can't keep the law. The law is good, just, and holy. But you, in flesh, you know, sinful flesh, you can't keep the law, even at your best state. Here's your answer. This is the answer. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. But see, you, you come to your answer, dear friend, by being broken and having contrition. And without those, you're a false convert. If you didn't come to the Lord Jesus Christ broken and contrite, but just one day woke up and say you believe and that makes you saved, you're lost. You're lost. It's not that hard, you know. The hard part, like I said, is getting over yourself. But let, okay, let's look at verse 24. Being justified freely by his grace, by his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, 
Oh, I think you know where we're going, don't you? Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. You know, for me to say the same things unto you is not grievous, but necessary. We have to remember, brethren, that we are still at war. There is still time. The doors are not totally closed. They're closing, but they ain't closed. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And those works are what? In Romans chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. Oh, really? See, because there are those out there who say will say to you, prayer is a work. <laughs> They're lost. Every single one of you who adhere to this prayer as a work, you're lost. You're lost. You're lost. You're lost. You have not been broken, and you have no contrition. No sorrow for what you did to the Lord. And someone of the Church of the Living God, someone who is saved, born again, converted, we, we have that sorrow because it's our fault that the Lord Jesus Christ went to that cross and died for a sinner who is chief. You don't have that. You're lost. You're lost. Okay? What can I say? What can I say? Not of works, lest any man should boast. Let's read verse 10. For we are his workmanship, those who are saved, Created in Christ Jesus to good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. He changed life after salvation. Which those who like to skip over brokenness and contrition and come to Romans 3 and, and adhere to 24 and 26, surprise, surprise, they speak against change life, but you're saved because you just believe. Go to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And if the Lord has given you the privilege, the humiliating, humbling privilege and grace to be used, by him, of him, for his glory, to present the gospel through the Romans road unto someone. By the time you get to Romans chapter 5, you're going to realize what you're dealing with. If someone's going to be in their, hardened in their heart, or someone who's going to be snotting all over themselves crying. Romans chapter 5, verses 5 on to verse 11. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Now, those who are saved, born again of the church of the living God, are the only ones who have the Holy Ghost. Okay? All right? We're the only ones that have the Holy Ghost. Okay? So, this is talking and uh, making reference unto those who are saved. Okay? This is what happens when the Lord saves you, okay? For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ, got, uh, Christ died for the ungodly. And yes, he did. Amen. Okay? For scarcely uh, for a righteous man, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love, love toward us, those who are saved, because the love there is a present tense. God so loved, past tense, that he gave 
past tense, okay? But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, those who are saved. Not this elect and not elect like Calvinists teach. No, 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 no. No, the atonement is there. It's being offered unto you. Okay, but you have to come on his terms, broken and contrite. Broken and contrite. Okay, and I'm telling you, in brokenness and contrition, you're going to call upon the name of the Lord. Okay, it, it, it just it's a it's a natural. It happens. Realizing that you're going to go to hell, the fear of the Lord, and that he died for you because of what you did to him, it, it, it all works together, see? And you're going to cry out to him. Okay? Verse 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood, because the blood of Christ cleanseth us from all sin, while animal blood only covered it. Because it was continual. Once the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth away your sin, okay, you're still going to sin because your spirit and soul are housed within the flesh, you know, the skin suit, okay? The sinful flesh. But that blood is there that cleanseth away all sin, okay? You're going to sin still, okay? I'll put the uh, thing for Romans chapter 6 in this, okay? Romans chapter 6 deals with that, okay? But let's continue. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. What wrath is that? The time of Jacob's trouble. He has not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation. What does that mean? Uh, the redemption of the purchased possession. The catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. That catching away, by the way, is wrongly referred to as the rapture, which is not in the scriptures. Okay? It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Or the redemption of the purchased possession. If you're saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, justified by his blood, you're purchased by God. He owns you. You get it? Let's continue. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Those who are saved. Those who are saved. You have to come to him broken and contrite and believe on him for what he did for you because of what you did to him. And I'm telling you, that brokenness and contrition is going to weigh on you and you will, you will call upon the name of the Lord because of that sorrow, that fear. And again, those who skip over that, they ain't saved. They don't have that. They don't. But now, okay, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. When you are saved by the Lord, by his grace through your faith, okay, and you come to him broken, okay, again, Romans chapter 3, specifically verses 21 on to verse 28, is the solution to your problem. It's the, as it says in verse 26, the declaration to you. Not the how-to. Okay? Because verse 19 and 20 
addresses the law. The solution is not the law. The solution is Jesus Christ. This is the declaration, dear people. Okay? Romans 10 is what to do. How to. Okay? How to. In that brokenness and contrition. We'll get to that. Okay? But when you come to the Lord broken and contrite and believe on Him, and in that brokenness and contrition, Lord, save me, and by grace you are saved through faith, and He saves you, your life is going to change. It just happens. Again, He doesn't force you. But see, remember that thing about the red button that we talked about earlier? Okay? You have the scriptures. And once the Lord saves you, you have the scriptures. Align your life with the scriptures. Because what he tells you how you ought to live today in this dispensation, which is located in the Pauline epistles, you read the entirety of the scripture. Okay? For instruction and in righteousness. But doctrinally for us today, it's the Pauline epistles. But you read the scriptures to learn how to live for today. Okay? Okay? What the Lord will have you to abstain from is for your benefit. Okay? Because 2 Corinthians chapter 5 beginning at verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, now note the ministry of reconciliation. Okay? Hinge that for, for right now, okay? To wit, God was in Christ. Reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Because you're a sinner. You're worse than that other guy that you like to compare yourself to. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. God can't sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And see, where it says here in verse 18, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us, the church of the living God, the ground and the pillar of the truth, his body, Okay? The ministry and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Okay? The ministry of reconciliation, the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us because God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ and the Lord is that spirit, the Holy Ghost dwells within us. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Go to Romans chapter 10, you devils. You devils. Okay. <laughs> Romans chapter 10. Verse 
verse 14 and 15. Um, this is what Romans 10 verses, uh, oh, excuse me, I wasn't there. Uh, this is what Romans 10 verses 14 and 15 are talking about what we just looked at in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You devils. Okay? Oh, we deal with it. You're the ones who are twisting it. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Call. See, what these devils do, they will circle, they will focus on the word believed and ignore all the rest of it. That's the tactic of manipulation. Okay? That's a manipulation tactic. They focus on the one thing while forgetting the broader thing. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? You know, someone who has, who has who is a minister of reconciliation and has the word of reconciliation, you twits. It's talking about those of the Church of the Living God who are out there. Okay, we every single one of us of the Church of the Living God, the ground and pillar of the truth, are a minister of reconciliation. Okay, there are different functions within the bodies that uh, uh, within the body, excuse me, that he has called us onto. But we all are ministers of reconciliation, and we all have the word of reconciliation. You devil twits. This is talking about those of us of the Church of the Living God giving the word of reconciliation. See. The people's ignorance is your weapon. And you, and you go after the feeble-minded. And how shall they preach, verse 15, except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. What do you do with uh, Romans 10, 14? <laughs> hey, Mr. Jesuit, shall we go through this one more time? Okay, so even someone like yourself can get it. Okay, go back now to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Okay, 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 I, I need that. Come on, don't look at me. Look at your, look at the scriptures, okay? Verses 18 on to verse 20. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Verse 18. And hath given to us Church of the living God, the ground and pillar of the truth, his body, the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ that be ye reconciled to God. Romans uh, 10, verse 14 and 15. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? <laughs> and how shall they preach except they be sent? 
As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And look at verse 26 in Romans chapter 3. This is the declaration of this solution to your problem, dear friend. Okay? Now let's read verses 27 and 28, and then we'll be done with this video, okay? Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Go to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. I, I could <laughs> right here. Romans chapter 4, verses 1 and 4. What shall we say then? That excuse me, beg your pardon. That Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But of debt, as if God owes you something. Let me put it to you this way. Those, these devils, Jesuit coadjutors, who jump over and ignore scriptural repentance, brokenness of self-righteousness and contrition, sorrow for what you did to the Lord, okay? They also have a big problem with calling because they are not broken themselves and they, in their own eyes, are better than people because they're not as bad as so-and-so. They still got their self-righteousness. And see, the ultimate shoe of someone who is broken, the lesser calling upon the greater, it just happens and I could explain that a million times a day till I'm blue in the face but there are some of you out there who just refuse but those who have ears to hear you hear okay here because see someone who just goes you know ignores scriptural repentance and contrition refutes the changed life that comes after salvation, refutes calling, and just goes to believe while stripping away everything else. Let me, sh let me show you to whom these people are actually likened on to. Go to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. And incidentally, um, having dialogue <laughs> with some of you of this persuasion is fruitless. Dialogue. Dialogue. They want to engage you in dialogue. Oh, manipulation. Subversion. That's what people who use, uh, open up dialogue with them. So what? You can subvert them and manipulate them? But these people who all of a sudden just by their own stuff believe, therefore they are obligated that the Lord will save them because they just all of a sudden believe. See, that, that's the thing. That's the thing. The works that are being referred to are the works of the law within the scriptures. But these devils, they believe, therefore... The Lord is obligated to save them because they just believe. Do you see how that works? How they do it, the devils? From the Vatican that they are, these Jesuits? But let me show you to whom these are likened on to. Luke chapter 18, verses 9 on to verse 14.
You're righteous because you are saved by your belief, right? And you said you've called, you've cried out hundreds of times, and you've yeah, because you've never been truly broken, dear friend. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. See, these guys don't have any love for you because they don't deal with brokenness, your self-righteousness. They are not of our Lord Jesus Christ because anyone of the church of the living God Ministers of reconciliation who have the word of reconciliation, we're going to go right after the, your self-righteousness. That's the way it works. Because anyone who is truly saved, born again, converted, the Lord attacked it. One thing you lack. One thing you lack. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one, a Pharisee. What is a Pharisee? Someone who sets tradition above the scriptures. Uh, the modern equivalent to that is a Roman Catholic, a Jesuit. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. Publican, someone who takes taxes and that kind of stuff, a money taker. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. Oh, if you're going to pray at, at all, just thank God for saving you because you just believe. <laughs> They're scamming you. They're scamming you. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. I'm not as bad as so-and-so. I'm saved because one day I woke up and decided to be a Christian because I believe. And God is obligated to save me now because I'm saved by my belief. Everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. And there it is. There is no fear of God before their eyes. There it is, dear friend. There it is. There it is. There it is. These devils dispute brokenness and contrition. They say it's not necessary. You can't be fixed unless you're broken, okay? They refute and are against calling upon the name of the Lord. Everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Calling upon the name of the Lord is the result of someone who is broken and contrite, which they are not, okay? They, they're against prayer. They say prayer is a work because they have no relationship with the living God. And they dispute the changed life. 
that God would have you to live a certain way according to the scriptures, but according to these devils, it's not, you don't have to do that because it's not going to affect your salvation. And while we are eternally secure, yes, we are. If you are truly saved, born again and converted, yes, you're not going to become unsaved, but your testimony, your life can be a wreck. And I don't know about any of you or the Church of the Living God. I don't want to get in just by the skin of my teeth. I want at least one crown. And anybody of the Church of the Living God would hope for the same. And finally, verse 28. Therefore we conclude in our Romans chapter 3. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Without the deeds of the law. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Okay, okay, I've skipped on. <laughs> Galatians chapter 2. Verses 16 on to verse 21. Galatians chapter 2, verses 16 on to verse 21. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. The changed life will come. Not at force. But he will show you, don't touch that, don't eat that, don't look at that, get away from that, put that guy or girl away from you, do this. You know, he says, trust me, I know what I'm talking about. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. And here, if you are saved... You're not saved. This is what we of the Church of the Living God have been given and which is there for you. The only thing that you need to deal with, dear friend, is being broken by our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, of your self-righteousness. Your self-righteousness. And, and unless... He breaks you of that. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. See, when you are truly saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, your life is going to change. Your life is going to change. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness came, if for if righteousness come by the law, excuse me, then Christ is dead in vain. Go to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. See, upon being saved by our Lord Jesus Christ, your life is going to change. Okay? Now, what we're looking at in Deuteronomy chapter 4, doctrinally and dispensationally, number one, it was under the law. Number two, it was talking, it is specifically addressing the Jewish people. But this is for instruction in righteousness. Okay? Going off of the changed life that will come upon true conversion, being of the church of the living God, dear friend. Because, let's be honest, 
Let's be honest there, friend. You know if you are broken of your self-righteousness and come to the Lord broken and contrite and call on Him and He saves you by His grace through your faith, you know that things are going to change. But what has happened? You have Catholic Jesuit coadjutors who come and tell you, well, okay, you're, you're a Christian now, right? You got to go to church, okay? You got to read a Bible. Uh, you got to read a Bible. Uh, whatever one doesn't matter. They all say the same thing, which is not true, okay? You got to go to a church building. Get a Bible. Anyone will do. In that church building, you got to tithe, right? See, and again, brethren, have you have you talked with lost people? What do they do? They equate what is Christian with going to a church building, don't they? And as to quote our beloved brother, Brian Denlinger, uh, for God's sake, don't go to church. <laughs> because remember, Roman Catholicism, Mystery Babylon, to them, their church, their, to them, there is no salvation outside the church. They mean the building. It's all intertwined with Catholicism, dear friend. But yes, if you, if the Lord truly saves you, your life is going to change. But it's not what you are being told by those who work for the Vatican. Okay? With that said, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 on to verse 10. This is right here for our instruction in righteousness. Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you for to do them, that ye may live, and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baal Peor. For all the men that followed Baal Peor, the Lord thy God hath destroyed from hath destroyed them from among you. Beg your pardon. But ye that did cleave unto the Lord your God are alive every one of you this day. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land where ye go to possess it. Statutes and judgments. See, um, people will say about the oldness of the letter, they'll say that you don't need the scriptures. No, you need the scriptures. This is how you learn how to live. Okay, Your life in Christ will be centered around the scriptures, that your life reflect the scriptures. Okay? Behold, I have taught you, verse 5, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Keep, therefore, and do them. For this is your wisdom. Wisdom is to fear the Lord. Look up Job 28, verse 28. For this is your wisdom, to fear the Lord, and your understanding to depart from evil, in the sight of the nations for our instruction in righteousness. When you are saved of our Lord Jesus Christ, you live according to the scriptures. So you minister of reconciliation with the word of reconciliation, dear friend. Do you get it? Let's read verse 6 again. Keep therefore and do them. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations. The fear of the Lord is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise, someone who fears the Lord, an understanding people, someone who departs from evil. And, you know, the ones who call themselves, who go by Christian, who are associated with church buildings, 
Is there, come on, for those of you lost people out there, what's different between them and you? Besides the fact that they call on Jesus, and but they listen to the same type of music you do, uh, look the same, act the same, sound the same, laugh at the same things. Probably one of them. See, lost people know. But you're scared because you fear man. There's no fear of God before you. continue verse 7 for what the nation is so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for and what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently Lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. Especially, oh, by the way, about verse 9, who's the one who's supposed to be teaching the children? Daddy and mommy. Not some Jesuit trained school teacher. Going after the Marxist example. Uh, verse 10. Especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. that they may teach their children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. See, the Lord saves you, your life is going to change. And you're not going to resemble a church building going Christian. You're going to be of the church of the living God. I hope, I hope you consider these things because to be saved by our Lord is quite easy. The hard part is getting over yourself. And see, these Jesuit coadjutors have come in and given you a solution outside of Scripture, jumping over things that are necessary for the Lord to save you. I do so hope that you take this to your heart. I, I, I do. I, I really do. I really do. Because unless you're broken of that self-righteousness of yours, you can't be fixed unless you're broken. And beware of these people who st adhere strictly to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 is truth. Absolutely. Amen, amen, amen. But Romans chapter 3 verses, uh, from verses 24 and 26 is the solution. It's the declaration to the solution to your problem. While these devils are avoiding all that leads up to this. This is the declaration, not the what to do. What do you do? See, unless you are broken and realize that you're not good, you're going to hell. Unless the Lord Jesus Christ save you, you are going to hell. Your answer is not keeping the law. 
Can't do it. Okay? You're, it definitely is not going to church because that is yoked up with Roman Catholicism. Your answer to your plight is our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. The greater blessing the lesser, but the lesser being broken will cry out to the greater. Verse 6 on to verse 13 in Romans chapter 10. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who hath ascended into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above, as does the Roman Catholic Jesuit priest. Another Christ, according to official Roman Catholic doctrine, they have the power to bring Christ down from heaven and put him into a perfectly round sun-shaped cookie. Yeah. Or, verse 7, Or who shall descend into the deep? That is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith, which we preach. The church of the living God, the ground and the pillar of the truth. You need to be broken, boy. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, a broken and contrite heart. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. See, that confession with the mouth, the lesser crying out to the greater, which will happen from a heart that is broken and that, has, and that is contrite which these who call themselves easy believism heretics do not have. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Uh, there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. Okay? Okay as pertaining to salvation, not culturally, as pertaining to salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans chapter 3, that's the solution to your problem. Romans chapter 10, here's what you do. Here's the go-to. And then you pick up in Romans chapter 6. See? And again, <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually quite obvious, to be honest with you. Um, these easy believism heretics, if they have talked to anyone about Christ, they have made false converts. Because no one of the Church of the Living God is going to sidestep the requirements of you being broken and being contrite. No one of the Church of the Living God, the ground and the pillar of the truth, who have been given the ministry of reconciliation and the word of reconciliation is ever going to sidestep that. You mark my words. So, that's going to be it for this video. I, I, I yesterday tried to do this video um, but th there was something very wrong. The Lord was not happy at all with what was done yesterday. I, I went to upload it, and then midway, is the Lord's like, Brad, no. Okay. One of those incidences where I was uploading, but the Lord's like, 
no, 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 no. So, and this is why. So, please consider these things. I love you. And on to every single one of you of the Church of the Living God. All of you, brothers and sisters. Thank you for your prayers. We are praying for so many of you. We pray for a lot of you. Please keep us in your prayers because, um, Lord willing, we need to get out of Illinois, where we live right now. This is, this is preposterous. And hopefully the Lord will move us out. Hopefully. We pray. But. And also, too, I want to mention quickly um, a video by my beloved friend, our brother, my friend that sticketh closer than a brother, uh, Brother Alexander Hartley. He did a video that made me weep like a, like a baby. It was, oh, I'm going to upload that. He gave me permission to do so. Uh, I'm going to upload that video after this one. Okay, so there's going to be two. Thank you, brethren, sisters, Church of the Living God. And sister, thank you. I'm, I'll catch up. <laughs> and uh, also to the brother um, who sent me uh, something about Book of Acts. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Very good. With what the sister and what you have kind of given, they play hand in hand. And later on, hopefully we'll see. But anyway, that's it. I love you. We'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.